Good morning and welcome to this virtual worship from Tapestry Church. We're so glad that you're able to connect with us this morning and hope that this time is centering and moving for you in whatever way you find that. Just a couple of reminders. There are some exciting things going on for Tapestry and we'd encourage you to make sure that you're keeping up to date with that through our e-news that's sent out each Friday. You can sign up for that at go to tapestry.flocknote.com if you're interested in that. That'll be across the screen here so that you can write that down. The other thing that we would remind you is there are so many events going on um, and so many things going on in our world. Oversight has set up a special resource um, on our website that will be updated with different um, books and materials that may be of interest to you. They also are starting a monthly um, oversight corner to spotlight different resources that are available as there are ongoing concerns in our world. So stick around at the end of the service to hear a little bit more about our partnership with Westwood Elementary School and their weekend bags. Chris and Lisa Fultz, and we are so happy to worship with you today. From our balcony, we see this painting every day. It's an outstretched arm holding a ribbon wrapped around a heart. The message on the ribbon is, love conquers all. This is a great reminder to us every morning about what is most important. As we prepare for worship, let us set aside the things that keep us from focusing on God. Let us set aside our to-do list. Let us set aside our worries. Let us set aside our anger. And let us set aside our busy calendars. Let us come with joy and thanksgiving to worship our God who loves us and never leaves us. And although we're physically apart today, we worship as one body of Christ. It's so unusual, it's frightening. You see right through the mess inside me. And you call me out. 
start again And I don't need to keep on hiding I'm fully known And loved by you You won't let go No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known Surrender to your kindness I'm fully known And loved by you You won't let go No matter what I do And it's not one or the other It's hard truth and ridiculous Grace to be known As we prepare to pray this morning, we remember those joys and concerns that are listed on our Tapestry Facebook page, as well as in our e-news, and we bring those all to God this morning, as well as the joys and concerns that we each bring on our hearts. Let us remember all these as we turn to God now in a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, as we come before you this morning, what a blessing it is to have you as the glue that holds our lives together. As we look to ourselves, we realize that we don't have what it takes mentally, physically, and emotionally to be able to keep our lives from spinning out of control. Thank you for being the rock that grounds us and the rock that we can cling to that allows us to trust in something greater than ourselves and greater than those things that we can see with our eyes. Loving God, the spring and summer have seemed so not normal as we are used to feeling somewhat carefree and able to relax in the longer, warmer days of spring and summer. This year, however, we are not feeling so carefree as we worry about wearing masks, being exposed to others who are sick, and trying to figure out how to live and love in the midst of the pandemic and in the midst of an unsettled world due to injustices among people. Help us to see our way forward, loving God, and help us to know how we might be your instruments of love and grace to a hurting world. Oh God, we are excited over the possibility of a new church space for us. Thank you for opening the right doors at the right time for us, and we pray for your continuing guidance as we discern how to begin meeting together again as your people. We love you and we praise you, holy God, 
And we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. A scripture reading from Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has come of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf, and they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and both brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this scripture is on the periphery of verses we've heard often during our time as Tapestry Church. The Hebrew people have been wandering for a long time. They're tired. They have followed Moses, passed through the Red Sea, and find themselves at the base of Mount Sinai. They have been waiting and waiting for the land God, through Moses, promised. It's difficult. We know all too well what waiting looks like. We know how it feels to be led to new beginnings, to think we've found it, to have our hopes dashed, to be tired. The people find themselves for a time without a leader. Moses has ascended the mountain to speak with God and to soon bestow the Ten Commandments upon the people. 
So I imagine they look a little bit like chickens with their heads cut off. What are they supposed to do? Who's in charge? Is he coming back? More and more questions keep flowing through. It's difficult when your sense of security and normalcy disappear. We also know a thing or two about what that feels like from the course of the last several months. As people, we struggle with not knowing what's next. We struggle to not have people for guidance. We struggle when our world is turned upside down. We don't always do chaos well. The world of the unknown leaves us with fears, anxieties, and troubled hearts. This is how I imagine the Hebrew people felt. Forgotten. Unappreciated. Alone. So the people turn to the next best thing. They approach Aaron and basically complain, Your brother left us. We don't know what to do. Give us some direction. Provide for us. Your move, Aaron. That's the first unhealthy move, in my opinion. The people notice something has changed. They know someone needs to step up, but none of them volunteer. They identify the problem and push the solution finding onto someone else. Granted, Aaron is perceived to be the second in command. There are stories of him often being Moses' mouthpiece because Moses stuttered and Aaron spoke more eloquently. Self-check. Have you ever had a time where you've seen a problem or a need that wasn't being met, and instead of plugging the hole yourself, you volunteered someone else, or maybe just ignored it altogether? Me too. Aaron also had a choice, though. He could have listened to the people's complaints and whining, and then kindly decline, declined involvement. It wasn't his responsibility. He could have easily walked away, turned a blind eye, or given suggestions that didn't implicate himself in the solution. I can't imagine how long it took Aaron to come up with an idea. And the scriptures don't tell us that. It seems immediate, but who really knows? What the people need in the absence of their highly revered leader is a way to connect with God. After all, Moses was their direct line to Yahweh. Here's where it gets tricky. The scripture story is often used to chastise and remind us that idols are not to be worshipped, that false gods are not to be followed. But was that really the understanding at the time? We need to read a little more of the story so that we can get to the heart of it. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped and sacrificed to it. And said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may, be, may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. God is mad because the people have seemingly made an idol to worship instead of worshiping him. This seems crazy from God's perspective, but let's pretend we're the Israelites for a moment. They're living in a state of chaos and unknown. Everything that has been normal and comfortable in their lives has been stripped away repeatedly. How would you respond in such a scenario? I'd argue that when forced into space and circumstance that we don't choose, we don't respond in our typical ways. When faced with medical bills, interpersonal conflict, job loss, house repairs, we don't always approach the outcome with a level head. And those are some of the pieces that are minutia. When faced with disappearance of a leader, our provisions being stripped away, global pandemic, cultural upheaval and turmoil, we definitely stray from our normal responses. These things instill fear in us and we go into fight, flight, or freeze mode. We are human. Sometimes we act before we think. Sometimes we don't act at all. Sometimes we run from what is happening around us. We may not be proud of it, but it's a part of life. 
From the extension of the scripture, we can see God's disappointment, anger, and annoyance. He sees the golden calf as a negative, as an insult, and disrespect from the people he saved, the chosen people. But we have to look closer at what the people actually asked Aaron when seeking guidance. We must remember that the scriptures we have were translated from other languages. Sometimes we don't have adequate words to convey the same meaning. Sometimes words don't even mean the same thing now as they did in another time and place. We must be diligent in our hearing, reading, and understanding. The words used for gods and Lord in this passage are Elohim and Yahweh, respectively. The latter being the most sacred of names for God and the representation that Aaron suggests an altar and festival. But here we must understand that the people weren't seeking foreign gods to replace Elohim. They were seeking a physical representation of him that they felt they'd lost with the disappearance of Moses. Their connection and physical manifestation of that connection was no longer present. It was commonplace for religions to have physical representations of the divine at that time. Moses, in many ways, served that role for the people, whether consciously or subconsciously. In their anguish and anxiety, they needed a physical representation to serve as a type of security blanket. But God didn't recognize this, not until Moses talks him down a little. So Moses then goes into full leader mode, crushes the commandments God has given them, signaling Moses' realization that the people can't live up to those standards. He melts down the golden calf that Aaron created, turns it to dust, mixes it with water, and the people drink it. After being forced to do that, who would consider doing such again? Here's where I see unhealthy move to, because this is Moses' com Moses's command and not ordained by God. <laughs> Moses then weeds out the faithful from the unsure. Those who still claim God are given swords and told to kill those who faltered, no matter who they are brother, mother, spouse, child. This seems extreme. But remember, no one told Moses to do this. This was not something put forth by God. Moses took it upon himself to do it. After that, Moses returns to God, convinces him that the people who are left are worth it, since Moses basically self-selected them based on their faithfulness. And the Ten Commandments we know were bestowed upon the remaining Israelites. That's a lot to take in. There's a lot there. Just as the people did not react how they normally would, here too we've seen Moses take initiative in ways that seem uncommon for him. And maybe even an overstep. <laughs> Under pressure, in uncharted waters, we do things that we don't normally. This can be good and bad. Perhaps we make decisions that we regret. Perhaps we get outside our comfort zone. Either way, we learn and we grow. And that is the important part. This story carries some pretty crazy elements, things we'd never think of in our wildest dreams. But with stories that start as oral tradition passed down through the verbal telling as opposed to the written word, Sometimes elements were increased in order to A, help people remember or to draw people into the story, or B, because it's natural to change and expand a story when it gets shared from person to person to person to person. So what's the point of all of this? God is seemingly telling the people what he also told to Moses up on the mountain. You aren't allowed to see me. No dice. God does not want to be contained into one depiction. He does not want to be boiled down to one thing. God does not want the people to put him in a box. God is limitless. Though it's seen through anger and annoyance in this passage, it's also reassuring for us in some ways. There's no limit to God. How awesome is that? So in those times of chaos and fear and feeling alone and being faced with the unknown, our God is with us and there is no limit to him. He's with us in the highs and the lows. 
He's with us when we can't see or hear or touch him. He's with us when we respond naturally in those moments we act a fool. He's with us in sickness and in health. He's with us richer or poorer. He's with us in the streets as we protest and in our homes as we donate. He's with us even when there are moments he'd rather do without us. Though we like a sense of control and normalcy, God reminds us he doesn't work that way. We don't get to define him or force him into being a certain way. He doesn't operate by our standards and rules. But one thing we can be sure of is that his presence and love for us never fails. And there is enough of it for all of us. Amen. On the Sundays that I get to do the communion meditation, I find myself feeling a sense of inadequacy. I don't always feel like what I share at this moment is meaningful enough or really if it'll connect with people. And I think it's a reminder for me that there are times in our lives that we feel that way. We feel inadequate. We feel like we're not enough. 
we feel like maybe we're not connecting with people in the way we want to, or maybe not at all. In times like these that we've had, where we've gone to extreme measures and had to live in a world that is topsy-turvy, I think it's easier to feel those things. It's easier to feel like you're not enough or like you're not measuring up or something is lacking about you or what you're doing. But we take heart in knowing that no matter who we are, no matter what we do, God is here for us. He provides for us and his son made a sacrifice for us so many years ago that we have the reassurance of in our life now, in the past, and moving forward. What a great gift that is. So I would remind you in those times that you feel that way, downtrodden, sad, like you're not giving your all or your best, remember that God is with you and God loves you through it all. There may be times you stumble or stray from the path, but this table is a place that we can come and share and be together and remember that God forgives us. The sacrifice Jesus made helps to wash away our sins now and always. We're human. We're not perfect. But God's made a provision for us. And how wonderful is that? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you so much for the community that is Tapestry Church. I thank you for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us so many years ago and the way that that still has an impact on our lives today. I ask you to use this table to connect us in a time that we feel disconnected from one another. Help us remember that we are all coming to you in this time and that can be our time of unity. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Jesus met in a room with his disciples and they shared a meal together. And at the end of the meal, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you think of me. And at the same time, he took the cup and blessed it and gave it to each of them and said, drink from this each of you this is my blood shed for you, a sign of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And so no matter what elements you're using this morning, we remember that time and we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. Amen.
Hi, Tapestry friends. I'm Emily House. I'm the student service advisor for Westwood Elementary School. Um, we were approached by Don Arnold to start a weekend food bag program for our needy students at Westwood. Um, we were really excited about this because Cleaners Food Bank was not able to take on another school, so we had a big gap in services to feed the students um, over the weekends because we know that they have meals here with us, breakfast and lunch, and then they can have um, meals and snacks on the weekend with these weekend food bags. So um, we developed a plan to send out weekend food bags with 18 of our neediest students, several of which were in sibling groups. Um, we were just about to start sending out food on the Friday before spring break, and then um, the pandemic hit. So we weren't able to follow through with that, obviously, because the school building was not being used for educational purposes at that time. So we developed a new plan on um, Tuesdays, every Tuesday, 9 to 11, we had a drive up situation where the parents could drive up and I would come out um, with my mask and my gloves and I would um, hand them their weekend food bags. And through that means, we were able to help um, about 10 students on average. And then there were several instances where I was able to actually go to the student's home and deliver the food bags. So um, we are just super, super grateful. Um, we know that Jesus calls us to be the hands and the feet and we can definitely feel God's presence when we are doing these food bags and with the families that are so appreciative and it's just a difficult time for everybody. So we really appreciate it. Westwood appreciates it. I appreciate it. So thank you so much and God bless. Well, good morning, Tapestry Church. Uh, my name is Dave Ennis. I'm the principal of Westwood Elementary School um, in Greenwood. And I just wanted to take an opportunity just to say thank you to, to the church for taking the op to being a partner with Westwood Elementary School. Um, it really kind of started with Mrs. Arnold and uh, Amy Jones in terms of saying how can they reach out and help um, uh, local kids and local students that are in need, um, just kind of being the hands and feet of God in a practical way. And what a great, um, what a great uh, partnership that I just that started this past spring. I know with COVID-19, it kind of changed the, the world a little bit in terms of what was going on, but I know there was at least, uh, there was 10 kids that we reached out to that basically just kind of, the, they didn't have stuff. Their parents had been laid off. Uh, some of the kids were uh, struggling. The kids, the parents were struggling already prior to COVID. And those are the kind of the kids we identified as just not even having things on weekends and having food. And I just want to say thanks to, to your entire church. Um, and just, I appreciate the partnership that has started and, and look forward to developing that partnership. And, you know, even as a public school employee, um, you know, we're, we're supposed to stay a or uh, secular, but I also want to say, as a Christian myself, I just want to say thank you to to the church for um, for basically being the hands and feet of God. You know, meeting a practical, finding a need, meeting a practical need, and then and then stepping to the plate. So. Thank you for uh, your donations. Thank you for your uh, your support. Um, you know, obviously, we continue to uh, appreciate your the part that partnership, and also just appreciate prayers. Um, and I can say that from a personal standpoint. Anytime you can offer prayers for the students of Westwood and just the students in general, um, it's definitely appreciated by uh, the school community and also appreciated by by me because uh, they work. And uh, praise God for all that you're doing. And I wanted to say thanks again. Have a great day. Go from this time now remembering that no matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter the choices you've made, God is with you now and always, and his present is limitless. Amen.